Hey, GearHeads, Jeff with Gear Report here at the Project Humvee Battle Wagon. What I'm going to do today is walk through all the gear that Brand sent in for us to use at Philmont Scout Ranch. I'll go through everything that was in my pack. I'll hit some highlights of things that were in our man's pack. Uh, but we're going to give you the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Stay with us. Backpacking at Philmont is like backpacking anywhere with, with a few exceptions. What we're going to cover in this video, talk specifically about our experience at Philmont Scout Ranch while we were backpacking. We were there for 12 days. 11 of those days were in the field living out of the backpacks with the gear that we have. For the most part, what we're talking about is going to apply to any kind of backpacking you do. There are some exceptions where Philmont does things differently, and I'll tell you about those as we get to them. But for now, let's dive into the gear. We are finally ready to open the bag. So let's do that. The Arc Blast from z Packs has a strap over the center, and then the top rolls down. So inside the bag, it's just a big tube. The outside pockets consist of these that I had two water bottles on each side, and then this big pocket, and that's it. All right, no other storage. So you open it up, there's Velcro at the top to open it. Uh, first thing I'll just tell you about real quick, this stuff sack has the crew tarp that we use. It's a 12 by 12 tarp from Sportsman's Guide that I bought several years ago to use with my hammocks. This was my winter hammock tarp. It's the really big, heavy car camping tarp. I say heavy, it was about almost two pounds. So honestly, for 12 by 12, it's kind of on the lightish side, but it was set up to be a diagonal pitch tarp to go over a hammock not a A-frame pitch tarp. So I had to make some modifications. You'll see where I sewed a reinforcement patch and a new tie out here with the old thread injector. I got a kit that had all of the orange tarp line with little reflective strips in it. I think it was 12 of these lightweight aluminum stakes with the little cords as well and the little aluminum adjusters. So I went ahead and put all this together like a day or two before we left for the trek. And this actually worked out really well. All told, we're probably approaching two and a half pounds with all the stakes and the cords and everything. Heavier than I'd like, but on the days that we got torrential rain, which only happened once during the day, it was fantastic to have a lot of coverage that everyone could get under if they wanted to. In fact, we only had one day where we needed to get under it, and everyone didn't get under it anyway. Some people just walked around in the rain gear, so we could have gotten away with a lighter tarp. We were expecting torrential rains every day. Otherwise, we would have taken the Outdoor Vitals, uh, they call it the Scout, it's a four-sided ultralight hammock tarp, again, meant to be pitched on a diagonal. They say it's 11.9 by 11.9, that's a diagonal measurement. The 12 by 12 on that Sportsman's Guide tarp is measuring uh, two sides on the perimeter. I have a little bit of an issue with how Outdoor Vitals advertises this is 11.9 by 11.9. I was expecting something the size of the sportsman's guide. This turned out to be about eight inches by eight and a half inches if you measure around the perimeter. It is, it's very light, uh, similar material to the poncho tarp from my trail gear. Very lightweight, very well constructed. Uh, it comes with the tarp lines with adjusters up at the edge of the tarp, which is phenomenal. I really love that. Actually has some, uh, I think it had stakes in the kit as well. Oh yeah, here they are. Not many, but a few stakes, I think four. Really, really cool tarp. Wish we could have taken it. Knowing how the weather turned out, I would have taken it, but we thought it was gonna rain more and we would need more coverage, so we took the bigger, heavier one. Uh, my apologies to Keith, who ended up carrying the big, heavy tarp instead of the lighter one that he would have been happier with. All right, moving on. I, what I carried for crew gear, this is our water treatment kit, okay, our water filtration kit. So a uh, paint strainer. So if we were filling the dirty water bottles to filter water out of something that, that had a lot of silt or had stuff in it, getting it out of a creek or a river or something, we could pour it through this to get the big stuff out so we can clog the filter. Fantastic. We also used these on the sump so we didn't have to use the big Frisbee strainer that Philmont gives you which is literally a Frisbee with holes drilled in it. This works so much better in a variety of different ways. Pour your stuff over the strainer, bundle it up, throw it in your uh, trash bag, uh, put it up in the bear bag and you're good. All right, 
I kept all the water stuff in this two and a half gallon hefty bag, usually right at the top of my pack. So if we needed, I could get to it quickly. The things we had in here from Sea to Summit, uh, the kitchen sink, this is a little water bag that you can scoop water up and carry it around. And when you set it down, it opens up and looks about like a sink. What we use the kitchen sink for on this trip, we had it so we could use it if we needed to do anything around camp where we needed water available, people to wash hands or whatever. We didn't use it for that. We could have, but we didn't. The only thing we used it for on this trip, and I don't know if it was worth carrying it for this, you hook this dirty water bag up top and it goes through the filter and into the clean water bag at the bottom. So you hook it up, then you send someone back to the river to fill this full of water. And by the time they get back, that dirty water bag is half empty. You can open the top without unhooking it, without stopping your filtering. You can use this to pour water in the top of that bag. We did that a few times, uh, especially when we were crossing the river from South Country to North Country. It worked really well for that. Uh, only used it once, I think, but uh, really cool product from Sea to Summit. You can go check that out. Platypus sent their two liter Gravity Works 2.0 filter system and we used it on a couple shakedown hikes and found we're using a Katadin, Katadin. I've heard it pronounced various different ways. I don't know, whatever it is, they have a big base camp filter. It's a big blue water bag with a large filter cartridge that fits up in the bottom. The tube comes out. The Platypus Gravity Works, what we found in our shakedown hikes was that people preferred having instead of a tube that you had to hold in your water bottle or you could walk away and leave it but you know there's nothing sealing it people preferred having this end that you close it up when you're not using it when you're ready to use it you open it up ah there we go all right here's what it's designed for so let's just i'll go ahead and show you how it sets up so uh, these are the dirty and clean bags for the two liter Gravity Works system. We actually asked that they send us the four liter bags, which they did. Pretty cool. On the dirty side, it's got a zipper at the top, so you can open it up and, and we use that kitchen sink to refill it in use. This strap hangs it from a tree branch or something. At the bottom is a quick disconnect fitting. So this goes in here. All right, as it hangs down, right? So gravity causes it to go through the filter, the water. At the bottom, one thing you can do on your clean water bag, there's no zipper on this one, it just has this at the top. It can have just a regular cap on it, this one, or it can have a pop-up cap. That's what it comes with in the kit. And that cap, this fits right on there. So you can close it and when you're ready to go, open it up and you just let it drain and it fills that bottom bag up and it's awesome. So what we found is these platypus caps, we got them at the Tooth of Time Traders, three bucks for two of them, so $1.50 for each of these caps, and they fit perfectly on the top of smart water bottles. That worked out great, or so we thought. Then we realized that the smart water bottle with this setup, it forms too good of a seal, all right? so. Uh, that's fine in a bag. The bag is collapsed and empty. As it fills up, you may have to loosen the threads and, and let some of the air out, but generally it works well. With the smart water bottle, they would actually stop filling it about a quarter of the way up because it, they'd be pressurized. You know, the water's coming in and compressing the air and it'd get to the point that it wouldn't work anymore. So instead, for the smart water bottles, what we did is we used this, which also came in the Platypus Gravity Works kit. This blue ring will fit on an algae bottle. It'll fit on some other things I'm not allowed to tell you about though. I'll just leave it at that. But it fits on an algae bottle. This is just a protective cover to keep this side clean. All right, this side, while it has threads to screw on, it also has this little insert that can be used separately. Uh, you could pop it out and use it just like this, or we just left it in here. When we wanted to fill up the smart water bottles, we would just pull this off of the end, all right, seal it up, put it back in the bag, and then put this on, push it on the tube. And now uh, for the smart water bottles, this fitting fits right down in. It'll work with, I think it's got a stepped rubber 
conical shape in here so it'll fit various different types of bottles i think uh, probably even up to like a gatorade bottle i don't know but it also has just a little tiny cut in the side that allows it to vent so you put it on here as long as you don't push it down and seal it too tight it will allow the air pressure to vent out as it fills you hang the whole thing up let your bag fill or let your bottle fill as it gets done you clamp it off with this little line clamp uh, take this off put the next bottle in okay unclamp it you see like that let it flow clamp it off when it's done change it to the next bottle uh, four liter dirty bag one liter bottles we were able to fill four of them in the time that was being filled someone could run with the kitchen sink and get water to refill this or usually what we did is we just switched out between the two liter bag and a four liter bag so while the four liter bag is draining someone was filling the two liter bag that was a huge bottleneck in our uh, shakedown hikes was when we used the two liter gravity work system and we only had two liters coming in we only had one source bag so when it was empty we'd have to disconnect take it down from the tree go fill it with water Water, wait for the sediment to settle out a little bit hook it up pressurize it a little bit you know squeeze it to get the water flowing all right that goes it's only two liters we filled two bottles we had eight people each person carrying three or four bottles we had to refill this a lot and it was a huge bottleneck switching over to the four liter bags was phenomenal that was great really really pleased with how that worked out that's all if we if we were there at the water source and wanted to filter we could use all the stuff that i just showed you and that's what we would use uh, a couple times we filled up our other water containers and carried the water to camp and did the filtering there just for time's sake to do that msr uh, which very interestingly to me uh, cascade designs is kind of the parent company that platypus and msr are both a part of i guess they're kind of competitive folk we're not supposed to link those two brands together because they're not they're separate companies and their stuff is not designed to work together the msr stuff works the platypus stuff works it's not really cross compatible or interchangeable however we did get from msr two different bags that we took on the trail one we used for dirty water that's this opaque one the dromedary bag 10 liter bag weighed about eight ounces i think empty so eight ounces to be able to carry 10 liters in in one big bag that was pretty good so a couple times we filled this up and someone just put it on you know his shoulders on top of his pack and carried it to the campsite so we could filter there and then sometimes we would instead of filling up everyone's bottles we'd just hang the bag up and fill this drum light six liter bag and then people could fill their, their smart water bottles or bladders or whatever you know leaving it hang up just use this little the little valve here just crack it open and it, it kind of pee into their bottle it's kind of funny really enjoyed both of these uh, no issues with either one of them uh, both work fantastic and something i learned is if you want to fill something out of this bag you take the the cap off either one of the drum bags the drum or the drum light this i didn't know what this was i, I was like is that a handle to carry it i don't know i'm not even sure this is what it's designed for but i figured out that you could hook whatever you were filling under that little lip and then pour and you know lift the back up if you needed to and it held it in place so you didn't spill it all over the place so really really cool design didn't use a, these bags every day didn't use a filter every day for that matter but they really came in handy when we needed it and uh, this was part of the crew gear that i carried was the water filtration kit partially because it was all stuff sent for gear report to review and for us to use on the trip and partially just because someone had to carry it so really pleased with that all the water filtration stuff water storage stuff we chose to use a gravity filter there are some crews who don't take any kind of filter all they do is use the MicroPure tablets that Philmont will give you and there's nothing wrong with that we used that uh, one day when we got to Stockade, we were going to the Stockade Ridge Camp, which is dry. You fill up your water at Stockade, which is a really cool building. I'd love to know if, if there's a story behind Stockade and why it looks like a little fort. I'd love to hear it. Uh, pretty cool little facility. Uh, but they, they have water there. But there was some debate as to whether it was 
potable water, potable water, whatever you want to call it, potatable water. It is portable water, we know that. Uh, how you pronounce the other is up for debate, but there was water there and one crew was telling us that it was potable water, safe to drink without treatment. Another was saying, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. We have changed our mind on the cleanliness of the water, so we do not think it's purified stuff. We need filter or do the tablet. After some internal debate, some pretty healthy debate, actually decided we were going to treat it because treatment's faster. Instead of filtering water, filtering water for eight people who need three or four liters each plus some extra for cooking, it takes a while. So that's the downside of using the gravity filters. It takes a while or any kind of filter. So we chose to do the water treatment tablets and it worked fine. It takes about 10 minutes to get all the bottles filled, get them out on the table, have someone go through and put the tablet in each bottle, seal them up, wait five minutes until it's ready to burp them, you know, let some of the pressure that's built up during the treatment process. It, it kind of looks like Alka-Seltzer as the oxygen comes off of the pill in the bottle. So that creates some pressure. You got to burp that off and then uh, invert the bottle with the threads loose to get some of the treated chemical that's in the water on all all the threads and everything to make sure you're not contaminating <laughs> treated water with untreated threads and stuff. So 10-15 minutes to do that versus probably an hour, hour and a half to filter the water for everyone. So we chose to do the chemical treatment. Worked fine, no one got sick from it. Personally, I can't stand the taste of the filtered water and I will absolutely deal with it if I need to. But if I don't need to and I have the option to filter, I'm going to filter. So that's what I did. I found these in my luggage. I forgot to talk about them out of the smellables bag. If you are a crew advisor, you're one of the adults there at uh, one of the pre-trek crew advisor meetings that they have at the picnic tables over near the infirmary, they will roll out a big cart that has a bunch of coffee packets. So you can get a Taster's Choice or Senka, you get non-dairy creamer, sugar, various kinds of, you know, sweetener, whether you like uh, Splendor or whatever, hot chocolate packets. I had this, what I thought was full, you know, 11, 12 days, I had 12 of these Taster's Choice packs and 12 non-dairy creamers and 24 sugars, and I thought I was good. And I had a handful of the hot cocoa packs as well. We hit the trail and I realized that for a one liter smart water bottle, ah, here it is, the packet is good for about half of it. The, the little taster's choice packet. You need two of those packs if you're gonna fill this. So what I would do, what I did the first day, we get up in the morning and I had my, in my smellable bottle, which we marked with tape, by the way. We had a green piece of electrical tape around everyone's smellable bottle, so we knew what was what. In my smellable bottle, I would empty two packs of taster's choice, two packs of sugar, and I tried a pack of non-dairy creamer and then a whole pack of hot cocoa mix. And I found that I liked it better without the non-dairy creamer. So I skipped that and just did the cocoa. It was like a backcountry mocha. It was pretty awesome. I started the first day I did it in the morning while we were getting ready and it took too long and it didn't mix up well. What I found later was I'd make the next morning's coffee mocha at dinner. As we're cleaning up from dinner, I get my smellable bottle, you know, finish a Gatorade in it, put all my coffee and, and hot cocoa stuff in it, fill it up with water, you know, most of the way, cap it, shake it up, and it'd go up in the bear bag with my personal stuff. So in the morning, all the stuff had developed and mixed together and it was ready to go and it was awesome and it was no work in the morning. So that was fantastic. So if you are an addict like I am, you know, I, I fully admit, I tell my kids, don't start drinking coffee because you know, when you get headaches, when you don't drink your coffee, that means you're addicted to it. And that's a bad thing. I don't like being addicted to anything, but uh, addicted to love, maybe, because that's a cool Eagles song. Aside from that, don't do it, kids. Stay away from the coffee. But if you are addicted to coffee, that backcountry mocha is a pretty awesome thing to have in the morning as you're eating breakfast or starting hiking. By the way, if you're going to do any kind of hydration tube, don't drink your Gatorade or your Kool-Aid or your, or your backcountry mocha or your coffee or anything through the tube. It'll make it smellable. You have to take it out and put it in the bear bag every night. Plus, it gets funky inside the, like the bite valve and stuff. Just do water through there, nothing else. For ground cloth under, under the tents, I got this duck window kit. Clear crystal shrink film. This does 10 indoor windows, it says. This is a polycryo sheet. It's clear plastic. It's incredibly light. A Tyvek ground cloth from my Big Agnes tent weighed seven ounces. This same size ground cloth of that polycryo material 
weighed about three ounces, two and a half, three ounces. I had a rip in mine on the trail because I was stupid and the wind was blowing it around while I was trying to set the tent up. So I put some rocks on it and then I was trying to pull it to one side a little bit, stretch it out to get it so it wasn't crumpled up. And the rock was too heavy and I caused a rip and that got out of control until I taped it. Aside from that, incredibly durable, had no issues. Now let's talk about the tent. And the tent is a bit of a mess because I had one problem with it on the trip. And it wasn't the tent itself, it's just the stuff sack. You can see it's ripped. Packing the tent up to leave Poneal. As I'm stuffing the tent down in and holding on to the top of the stuff sack, the stuff sack ripped. So I'm gonna, gonna have to get a new bag for this or patch this up or something. This is the Big Agnes Fly Creek HV2 Platinum. This is their top of the line, two person ultralight backpacking tent. We had a couple different tents in our crew. We had, well, four. This one and our man and the two guys he was with carried one that we'll see in his pack. It's the My Trail Company UL3. It's a three-man ultralight tent that weighed three pounds. This is a two-man tent that weighed two pounds, you know, one pound per person. Because of the mix of youth and adult that we had in this Boy Scout trip, we had five youth and three adults. So two adults or brothers, they shared a Henry Shires tarp tent, which is a single wall tent and was great for them kind of snug but very lightweight great for them when it was dry out when we did have a little bit of rain i think they got a little bit wet i don't know if that's the tent design or if it's just older i mean my understanding is it used to be great but it's been used and used and used and maybe the waterproofing and what it used to be the the other pair they used an alps uh, it was an alps mountaineering i think two man uh, they called a backpacking tent but it's like four and a half five pounds it's just the standard tent that our boy scout troop uses they're 17 18 years old strong fit guys it didn't matter to them carrying an extra couple pounds so they were cool with that i'm 45 almost and uh, have a bad back and bad knees and bad shoulders i want as light a weight as possible big agnes really stepped up with this tent on a shakedown hike our man and i shared it i'm 6'4 he's about 5'6 you know i'm 205 pounds he's 120 pounds the two of us together we were okay it was a little snug but we were fine if it were two people my size we probably still could have pulled it off if we had to but it would have been less comfortable for me as one person in this two-man tent it's a small two-man tent or a big one-man tent that's the way i look at it i was in heaven in this tent it didn't leak when we had torrential downpours and if you've been to philmont you understand what i mean it i'm like really monsoon type rain overnight uh, we had it at poneal we had it uh, in the east evening at Poblano Ruins and then we had it one other time can't remember where that was I never got wet inside I got spritzed through the the screen a little bit one time at Poblano Ruins it rained during the day right after we set the tents up I didn't have the vestibule on this tent cranked down to the ground all the way the rain was hitting so hard I put it up in the wrong spot just like golf, I can't read greens. I have trouble reading where water's gonna flow in a campsite. And I set it up right in the middle of the little drainage area. But even with that, where I had a half inch of water like actively running around my tent and under it, it didn't get inside the body tub at all anywhere except for a little bit of splashing where the vestibule wasn't down tight to the ground. The water would hit the ground, splash up under it and hit the bug net because it was coming down that hard and a little bit came through and I probably had a teaspoon of water on the inside when I got in after the storm was over. Um, light, easy to put up, easy to take down. Uh, didn't need the repair sleeve for the tubes. I think I lost one of the stakes, but I found several others while I was on the trail, so that was okay. Very happy with this tent. Uh, I was nervous because it's ultra lightweight, and you can see that this is the stuff sack material that ripped here. I, I believe it's the same material the tent itself's made out of, and I was concerned that if I got any rip anywhere, it was done. Everything held together, all the poles held together. Thrilled with it. Big Agnes, you got a winner here with the uh, Fly Creek HV2 Platinum. All right. Next, show you a little bit of Phil food. All right, this is Philmont food. It comes in bags like this. This is lunch number seven. So every day they have one through 10 
are the different options, if I remember right. So on the first of the month, they use number one. So there's a breakfast, zero one, lunch, zero one, dinner, zero one. On the second day of the month, you do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, zero two. So that's how they rotate them. If they're 30 days in the month, they'll go through the rotation three times. If you're on the trail for 11 days, you will see whatever you get the first day, that's what you're gonna get the 11th day as you repeat. This is what a lunch would look like. And honestly, this is kind of a mesh of some extra stuff so we've got some original Gorp banana chips. Banana chips were in swap boxes quite a bit, but they're kind of awesome. I liked them. Um, Good Thins sea salt and pepper rice chips. I was not a fan of these. That's probably why they're still in here. We have Sweet Sue Premium Chicken Breast. Uh, that was okay. We used that in a couple different meals, so we still got two of these. Country Time Lemonade and some All Sport drink packets. The drink packets were great because, you know, filtered water, treated water. Even if you get water at a staff camp that has a solar-powered well and has a chlorinator so you don't have to treat it, still doesn't always taste great. So the drink packs really help to deal. And there's the solar well with the chlorinator. With any flavor issues that someone may have, but more than that, from a medical, from a wilderness first aid standpoint, you know, we were taught that the electrolytes, you know, your body's just a big electrical system, and there are minerals and things that are needed to help the conductivity of electricity throughout your body, and that's what where the electrolytes come in. And I'm sure I'm bastardizing this from a science or medicine standpoint. So leave a comment if you know how this really works. Short version is a lot of the drink mixes have those electrolytes, things that you're going to sweat out, things you're going to deplete, that if you're just drinking water without those, you can have some, some other issues. So they encourage the drink mixes, usually at half strength, so that it, the sugars don't suck all the moisture you know, to your stomach and cause dehydration issues. Fill food, it's bulky. This is probably about the size of what a lunch would look like, even though there's some different things in here maybe. It's about what lunch would look like. The breakfast maybe a little smaller, dinner maybe a little bulkier. I think the most we carried was four days worth of food, which was a lot. I mean, it took up some bulk in the pack. And for me, there were days that I was able to roll this top down, like way down. And then when we had full food, and then we're also at a dry camp carrying extra water, I was barely able to seal this at the top and pinch it over. And that's a 60 liter bag. So I had wanted to take a smaller capacity pack. Maybe if I had gone lighter and smaller on some of my other items i could have done that but man it would have been tough because that fill food's just so bulky and it's kind of heavy we'll get into clothing here we get to philmont and the forecast was calling for warmer because i really I, I tweaked and tuned my clothing i didn't want to carry any weight i didn't have to so i left home a little bit of insulation forecast when we left the house to get on the plane to go to philmont i was going to be fine by the time we get to philmont the Philmont, the forecast had changed, gone down maybe five degrees. I was right at that critical edge where if it only got down to 44 at night, like the forecast said when I left the house, I was fine. If I got below 40, I was, in, I, I was gonna be cold probably. So we get to Philmont, now the forecast for a few nights when we're up at higher altitudes is more like 37 degrees. I'm just into where, okay, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be cold at night, what am I gonna do? And not just at night, but in the mornings and in the evenings when I'm not in you know, the sleeping bag, so to speak, where I could deal with it a little easier. So I wanted another layer of wearable insulation. And to be honest with you, the Tooth of Time Traders has got a lot of really good gear. They've gone out of their way to not have junk, only have things that they would recommend people take on the trail at Philmont in a very rugged environment. Unfortunately, that means a lot of the stuff is pretty pricey as well. I was in a dilemma because my budget was shot. I had no money left, but I needed something warmer. I was lucky, we'll see, our man had a nice uh, down jacket from my trail company. I didn't have that luxury, so I went through the shop at Two The Time Traders and I found this vest. This is quite possibly one of the ugliest wool sweater vest I've ever seen. I don't know, maybe it isn't, maybe you like it, but you know, here's, here's what I look like when I was wearing it. 
you know, I, I'm fashion illiterate, but to me, this was not something I would have gone out and bought on purpose. Most of the people do the time traders are pretty good. The guy that was helping me kept trying to get me to buy some cotton-based stuff, which I wanted nothing to do with. I don't want cotton on the trail. I want something that's hydrophobic, that's not gonna hold water. This is 43% acrylic, 30% wool, 27% polyester. So either wool or synthetic, I was pretty happy. Felt heavy enough, warm enough. Still haven't weighed it, don't know what it weighs. At about 50 or $54, it was the best value I could find to give me units of heat, you may say, or insulation versus cost. This was the best deal I found in the shop. Uh, using it on the trail, I was very pleased with it. I actually really liked having it as a vest. Had I not brought this, what I would have brought with me was a fleece vest because I like that it keeps my core warm, but as it heats up, my arms aren't sweating. Uh, it's a nice for that kind of bridge temperature where I don't want to put a parka or a coat on, but I need a little bit of extra warmth. Incredibly pleased with how this performed on the trail in spite of it being heinously ugly. Really pleased with it. Uh, the brand, in case anyone's interested, is called Bear Ridge Outfitters. And uh, I'll check and see if you can get it anywhere else, but I know you can get it at Tooth of Time Traders, the, the official shop of the Philmont Scout Ranch. Other things I carried with me. These are two and a half gallon hefty bags. I think we generically call them Ziploc bags. I think Ziploc, Ziploc is a trademark thing for some other company, but they, they have that kind of zipper seal at the top. They're heavy duty. And what I use this for is with a little bit of camp suds uh, when we were allowed to use them. Sometimes we were washing clothes too late after seven o'clock. You can't use anything smellable like camp suds, or maybe it's after five, I don't remember. Put a couple items of clothes in here, fill it you know, two thirds of the way with water, put a couple drops of camp suds in there, zip it up, shake it, knead it, really shake it around, then go dump the water down the sump. It's gonna come out funky, nasty, brown, dirty water. This is your trail clothes washer right here is a big, big Ziploc bag. Use that several times. You do it with a little soap, then you do another to rinse and then wring the stuff out and hang it on the backpack. I mean, it looked like a, looked like a walking clothesline quite often. And, and you see, I had some like quart size Ziploc bags that I never even used. Had a few of these that we use for various things, but the big deal is this is how we wash clothes on the trail. I saw people at Philmont, just as any other time I've been backpacking, that the whole time they're on the trail, they don't wash themselves, nor do they wash their clothes. I wash my stuff every day. Every day I was either washing something or maybe every other day in a couple cases when it, when it just wasn't possible. Every morning I was putting clean clothes on and that was really important to me. I just am not into the, you're in the woods, you have to be filthy for health reasons, just for general how I felt reasons. I didn't want to do that. All right, here's another one of those Sea to Summit Nano Stuff Sack. This color, for me, all of these are the eight liter bag. This is what I use for my clothes. So like I said, every day I was cleaning clothes. So if they weren't clean, they went in a Ziploc bag. Philmont will give you a stack of, you know, gallon, gallon and a half size Ziplocs. Maybe they're two gallon, I don't know. Not as heavy duty as the one I just showed you for laundry. And I used one of those to put dirty stuff in. Once I cleaned and dried it, then it went in my clothes bag. One of the guys using an REI Flash 65, because of the way the frame and everything on that is built, he said he would just do this, fold it over, and then tuck it in his bag and then it would conform. He could squeeze it into different places. What I found with the z -Pax bag, it has a very, very thin carbon fiber stay on each side and then two cross pieces. That's it. It's an external frame pack and it's a very light frame. I found, especially the last day on the way out, I didn't have enough down at the bottom here. Sleeping bag on one side, the other side didn't have enough and it kind of collapsed in and it got really uncomfortable. So in this bag, I needed more rigid support from the stuff inside. So my clothes, I would fold this over once and then push the air out and then roll it up to kind of get a vacuum in it and make it a little bit more rigid and then shove it down in there in the bag so it would have more form to it. And that did great to help give me a little extra support inside the bag. Also, these are completely waterproof. Should anything have gotten in the bag, it uh, would not have gotten wet. So what do I have here? These are 
my long underwear, synthetic, most of this stuff synthetic, all of it synthetic, I guess. Since we got past the wool, this is a Champion Performance Base Layer. Very pleased with this. I think I only wore it once. Uh, the morning we got up to hike to Baldy, and I ended up with it on most of the day just because I didn't have a good chance to take it off. But we hit the trail early. We were up at 4.30 that day, so, and we were at Miranda, kind of high altitude, so I needed that uh, when I got up. Um, most mornings, pretty much every morning, I wore this. It's from Under Armour. It's part of their Tactical series, Tactical XL, it says. It's a long sleeve insulated top. It's kind of tight, you know, form-fitting as most Under Armour is. Uh, some of it's baggy, most of it's the tighter stuff. This is the tighter type. And it almost has a feel or look of a neoprene, but it's not. It has like a microfiber loop on the inside and a smooth outside. And when I weighed this, I thought this was going to be heavier than some of the other thermal top options I had because it's so much warmer and it feels denser, but it was actually lighter than some of the other options. So big lesson for you on both of these insulating layers. I had picked what I was going to bring with me based on what I thought was lighter and based on, you know, a little bit on insulation, mostly on weight. I liked both of these better. They're warmer than the other options, but the other options were lighter. So I thought when I got the scale out and weighed them, I found these were lighter and they're actually the warmer options as well. So I was fortunate I was able to switch those out since I had weighed them and go lighter weight and have better insulation. And I needed, especially the top, I needed that many days. Uh, for underwear, I went a different direction at first. I think it was Hanes, uh, like a Cool Max or something like that they called it. Uh, very light, airy. You hold them up to the light, you can see through them. Stretchy underwear. I, I like the long because it gives some uh, chafing protection between your thighs if they're prone to rubbing together. Um, synthetic, no cotton in these whatsoever. That's important for the underwear you take when you're backpacking anywhere. The Hanes fit too loose. They let things move around a little more than I liked and I was getting some chafing issues on our shakedown hikes. They're by Russell, they're called Cool Force Performance, 95% polyester, 5% spandex. The spandex gave it a little bit of compression and helped hold them in place so that the, the little bit of coverage on the inner thigh stayed in place to give me some chafing protection um, so that I didn't have thigh rubbing against thigh and causing chafing. Sounds weird. Some people may be embarrassed to talk about it, but it's a real issue if you're backpacking anywhere, not just Philmont. So I was very happy with how these uh, Russell underwear worked out. You know, when I was wearing shorts, I had the underwear. You know, when these were being washed, I would wear the My Trail Company, you know, uh, Hyperlite Trail Shorts. Incredibly light, very breezy, you know, great ventilation. And the reason I, I said I could have got away with one pair of underwear instead of two was that these have underwear built in. Unfortunately, they're kind of tidy whitey type underwear, which gives no coverage between the thighs. So I actually had a day, we had a pretty high mileage day where we were working pretty hard. And unfortunately, hiking later in the day than we wanted to, where it was warm and we were sweating. And I started to get a little bit of rubbing, uh, kind of pre-chafing going on. So I had to be sure I switched out and had the underwear and the shorts uh, the next day so I didn't get any chafing issues. And you know, one day I actually had to go to my second pair of underwear to wear the shorts two days in a row because we had two heavy days of hiking. And I was afraid I may get some chafing if I wore the hiking short. The Gold Bond powder actually was very helpful when I was wearing these to get that kind of pre-chafing under control. Keep that in mind if you're gonna be out there hiking or any kind of backpacking, male or female, doesn't really matter. If your thighs rub together and you're sweaty, you're gonna get chafing, it's gonna get raw, it's gonna get uncomfortable. So wear something that's gonna protect you from that. Two companies provided socks for us to review. Here are uh, the Damascus, you know, one quarter height socks from Farm to Feet. Both of these are 100% American made companies that we'll talk about. These are wool, it's a, a wool blend, single layer socks, but it's kind of a 3D printing. So they're a little thicker in some areas and there's some 
uh, kind of raised ridges or ribs on the top and thinner in the bottom with some kind of channels. And they, they can really do some cool things with the looms when they're actually weaving the threads into fabric and change the density and thickness and all kind of things. These actually, for single layer socks, proved to be pretty effective and comfortable on the trail. Really enjoyed those. A couple other people wore farm to feet socks on the trail and had great success with them, even though they're single layer. And I mentioned that because the other socks were from Wright Sock. Uh, both of these are North Carolina companies. Uh, farm to feet's up in the mountains. Uh, Wright Sock is here uh, across town and Burlington, North Carolina. So I was thrilled to work with a local company on these. This is the Escape model, the thicker version, and they held up pretty well. It's still thinned out a little bit, but they're dual layer socks, and they have a little bit of that 3D printing effect on them as well, but also have a separate layer, this white layer on the inside. So it's two layers, that means, especially on your heels, uh, where you may get a hot spot and a blister, the two layers of socks are gonna rub against each other and absorb some of that friction and keep it off your feet. So really great in wicking moisture away from your feet with that inner layer to the outer layer to keep them drier, as well as giving you some friction relief to help prevent blisters. Honestly, uh, some guys got blisters between their toes, which socks aren't gonna help with, minor blisters between their toes. I think I'm the only one who got real blisters, and that was because I changed the way I was tightening my shoes and it caused problems. But I had on the ball of my feet right here on each foot, smaller one on my right foot, the one on the left got to be pretty big and painful. Overall, both of those type of socks worked out fantastic throughout the trip for me. Our man had no issues with his socks and no one else on the crew. The entire crew was outfitted with both of those brands of socks and no one else had any real issues aside from a little toes rubbing together stuff, which the socks can't help. The right socks, especially with the two layers, are fantastic. Was happier with the farm to feet than I expected to be given that they're only single layer, but they were a little bit thicker. The other pair from the right sock were the Cool Mesh 2, and they proved to be a little too thin for what we were doing. We were, I'm, I'm 205 pounds, carrying you know, 30 pounds of stuff on my back. I, I'd like to add thicker for my second pair of right socks, but I took three pair of socks on the trail, and I could have gotten by with two, but it was nice since the, the Cool Mesh were thinner that I was able to cycle through some thicker socks occasionally as well. And having three meant that even if I couldn't wash every day, I was always putting a clean pair of socks on every day. And that was a big deal to me. I think that wearing clean socks every day makes a big difference in avoiding blisters as well. I carried this mismatched pair of wool and acrylic gloves just in case I needed them. Never got cold enough that I actually got them out and put them on, but had them in case. The last thing, was also from my trail company. They're hyper light, short sleeve t-shirt, incredibly light, breezy, airy, well ventilated, fit really well. I'm seeing where, where the backpack was sitting, you know, up against my shoulder and a little bit down in the back here and where here where the, the pack came over in the front so, and some snags where branches and things grabbed it at different times. So when you go for ultralight or hyperlight stuff. It's not going to be as durable, but it held up for the whole trip and was fantastic. The other clothes I wore is what I have on now. This is a polyester, probably stretchy. You know, both the shirts kind of stretchy, lightweight, synthetic, breathable shirts. This one happens to be for the troop that the crew came from. I actually weighed all of my synthetic shirts and picked the lightest one available to take with me. We talked about the REI pants. I think that Sierra's the current model like these. Uh, couldn't be happier with them. And then the shoes, the other thing I wore, these are from Columbia. Honestly, I ran out of money. Ultra running sent the Lone Peak 2.5 low and the Lone Peak 3.0 mid, kind of a high top looking trail running shoes for me to use on this trip. But unfortunately they sent the Neo Shell version, not the ventilated version, not the mesh version. And the way my feet sweat, they just didn't breathe well enough. And my feet looked like shriveled up prunes all the time. I'd love to take them because they're lightweight and incredibly comfortable and have a really wide toe box that I love. But they didn't breathe well enough. I just couldn't take them. So it, late in the game, I had to go track down some shoes. These are from Columbia. They worked well. I uh, probably could have put a little better insole in them, but they had great grip, great stability, 
great durability. I did struggle a little bit with how tight or loose to tighten them and ended up with the blisters on the bottom of my feet because of that, but they breathed really well and kept my feet from getting too soggy on the trail. And when they did get wet, they dried out pretty quickly. So pretty happy with those as well. So put all this back in the stuff sack real quick. This really made organizing my bag easier, by the way, having all of the stuff. Nothing was really loose inside my bag. So I opened the bag up and there may be six different things in it, you know, this being one of them. So I could quickly pull things out, get to what I needed, put stuff back in. Made it real easy keeping everything in these waterproof stuff sacks. All right. Oh, luckily the bag's almost empty. Another one of these, this is the, the Nano 4 liter bag from Sea to Summit. And this one actually got a little rip in it, so it's not waterproof anymore. Again, ultra lightweight, you give up a little durability, but uh, I was happy to have it and, and happy to have the Nano instead of the heavier bags they offer that are more durable. These are sleep clothes, so uh, they have a big bear problem at Philmont. I say it's a big bear problem. There are lots of bears around. It's rare that a bear attacks someone and they have had deaths by bear attack at Philmont before. So whether you're hiking at Philmont, prepping for a Philmont trek, or going elsewhere, it's important to be aware of your bear procedures and really take them seriously. I don't know why I put this away. I wanted to talk about my sleep clothes. This is just a synthetic long sleeve shirt. Uh, some nights I didn't even wear it, but until it got cooler and then I'd put it on if I got chilly. Um, and then I had just a pair of like lightweight synthetic gym shorts and I did not wear these anywhere except when I was sleeping um, except for the morning that we hiked Baldy and I was cold and needed another layer I put this on and then uh, before the end of the day I actually was able to wash it very well at uh, where were we Baldy Town I was able to wash it at their little wash station and dry it so that I could you know, it had been washed. I hadn't eaten in it. I hadn't gotten food on it. Uh, so I was able to reuse it once it had been washed as uh, sleep clothes. But that worked out pretty well. And I kept it in a separate bag uh, just for organization purposes. This went at the bottom of the bag beside my sleeping bag and tent because I didn't need it until it was the end of the day time to go to bed. So all the stuff I needed to get at during the day was at the top. The less likely I was to need it, the lower it went in the pack. These stayed at the bottom and were in their own separate bags that are easy to get to. This, yeah, this is the last thing in the bag. This is my sleep system. And normally this pillow that I got last minute, showed up a day or two before going on the trek, Order it from Amazon. It's a Nature Hike Outdoors inflatable pillow. Weighs like 2.6, 2.8 ounces, something like that. Blow it up in four or five breaths. It's got a neat little valve that, you know, I think that's closed and that's open. So, there you go, blown up. And then when you're done, you just pop the valve, you know, do push the button and it pops loose and, uh, you know, all the air comes out pretty easily. Fantastic little pillow. This made my life so much more comfortable on the trail. I'll talk to you about how I did that. In this set, normally this would be in, in the bag here, but I actually haven't unpacked this since getting back from Philmont. And I carried this on the plane with me uh, so I could use it uh, to sleep on the plane, and it worked great there as well. In the Sea to Summit Event Waterproof Compression Sack here, we have a uh, couple things. I think any backpacking trip you could pack this way, but especially the way we did things at Philmont. I liked having the compression. Uh, our man had the same bag. He didn't use, compress it very often because he had a 70 liter bag and, and had more room in the bag, so he just didn't need to. And that's great, great thing about taking a bigger bag if you have the discipline to not fill your backpack with stuff you don't need. You know, sometimes if I have extra room in the, in the backpack, like, well, I have room, I'll go ahead and take this just in case. Well, he has the discipline to not do that. So that meant that he had the room to not have to use the compression sack, just use it as a stuff sack. And I think he only compressed it once. So in here, I would have my pillow and 
This is where I kind of went off the trail a little bit from what most people do. Instead of a sleeping bag, I got a down throw from Costco and reworked it to be a top quilt. I cut, cut a couple rows off the side, moved it to the bottom, made a foot box so it would be tall enough for me and also have a foot box. And it weighs one pound and that's what I was going to take. But then we, the temperature was forecast to be a little bit lower than I was comfortable with that. And it was forecast to thunderstorm every day. And I was afraid to take untreated down on the trail, especially when I was already going to be right at my temperature limit. So I fell back to the Snug Pack Jungle Blanket XL. So this is it's not even a sleeping bag. It's a blanket. It, it doesn't have any foot box. It doesn't have any zipper. It weighs two pounds in the stuff sack, probably slightly less out of it, and it is incredibly warm, and I am so thrilled with this. It did absolutely fantastic the whole trip. Two pounds was lighter than any other option I had, and it compressed down pretty well. Thrilled with that, and it's like 40 bucks, I think, on Amazon, something like that. It is a steal. This is, I mean, if you want to buy one thing out of all the gear here, if you want to take away one thing, this Jungle Blanket XL is an absolute steal. And if you're not 6'4 like me, you probably don't even need the XL. You may be able to get away with the regular, which is, you know, less and weighs less. And then as a sleeping pad, last thing in the in the event stuff sack, this is from this is a, a another risk I took off of Amazon. Hikenture. Not even sure I'm pronouncing that right. It blows up in seven or eight breaths. And this section at the top puffs up as a pillow. And down here, it's uh, maybe an inch thick for the rest of it. I really, really uh, was leaning towards taking the REI Stratus. This is the uh, long version, but it weighs one pound, nine ounces. This one weighs about 14 or 15 ounces. The Stratus is two and a half inches thick and has an R value 2.9, so almost three. So it gives some insulation, uh, make it a little warmer under here. This doesn't have any insulation, but when I had to go from the one pound down top quilt to the two pound jungle blanket, I said, you know what, I gotta shave a little weight. So I opted to take this. And the first night or two, it was not incredibly comfortable because to, to get the one inch section down here, firm enough to support me because I'm a side sleeper without my hip hitting the ground. I had to really blow it up as hard as I could. And then the pillow was too firm. Uh, and what I was doing initially was blowing this up part way and putting it between my knees because my lower back issues, I need a pillow between my knees. So what I found was I go ahead and blow this up all the way, use this as a pillow, blown up, you know, most of the way, not over pressurized, the perfect height for my neck, everything was great. And then I used my, uh, one of my stuff sacks with, um, with my warm clothes that uh, for most of the trip I hadn't, hadn't, hadn't worn the bottoms, just enough in that stuff sack that I could put it between my knees and get the, the angle that I needed to keep my hips aligned. Everything worked great. Actually, the, the lower back problems I had before the trip, I was afraid they'd get worse on the trip, they actually got better while in this sleeping arrangement. So I was really surprised at that. Thrilled with how these worked out, like the weight and everything. I'd love to have been lighter, but they worked out pretty well. All right, so that covers everything in my gear. So let's quickly go through the things that our man used that were sent for review at Gear Reports.